Good morning. So I've known Celso for about 10 years and he still calls me João. <laughs> and guess what? He also told me to prepare this in English, so I did. Um, I'm going to tell you about magic and programming. Um, my name is José, I work as a technology evangelist, but I'm also a close-up magician. And I wish I could tell you how passionate I am about magic. And I wish I, were, I had a way to show you how passionate I am about playing cards in particular. I wish I had a way. Um, and also, I wish I had a photo that could show you how many decks of cards I've been through. But unfortunately, all the pictures I have are rather old, or they only show a bit part of my collection. And you might, may wonder, if you're so passionate about magic, why don't you do it for a living? Why don't you do it professionally? I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. We magicians have a different saying, which is, if you love magic, don't do it for a living. And there's a multitude of reasons for this. One of them is that there's the whole business side of magic, dealing with clients, with payments, with venues, all those things that I don't care about. Today, I want to talk to you about the evolution of the illusion sawing a woman in half, uh, secrecy in the world of magic, progress in the world of magic, how the two are related, and what the hell all of this has to do with programming and technology. A bit of a disclaimer though, this is not in any way a complete course in magic, and this is, this is not in any way a complete course in the history of any of the illusions I'm going to mention today. Uh, in fact, I'm going to oversimplify a lot. And before we get this conversation started, there's something we need to clear out, which is, what is magic? Magic is not about puzzles, it's not about fooling people. Magic is about seeing something and not saying, I don't know how you did it, but rather saying, I know that that is impossible. So magic is about the illusion of impossibility. I call this illusion because most modern audiences are aware that magic isn't real. Um, I say most. Um, I do know a magician who went to a remote part of Africa, and as he was paying for a drink with a coin, he figured he would make the coin vanish. So the coin vanished, and so did the bartender running away, back to the village, so that he could bring the whole village with him, because the wizard from the prophecy had returned. <laughs> so that still happens. Uh, but most modern audiences are aware that magic isn't real. Sawing a woman in half, a couple of things I need to call your attention to. Um, this name of the illusion, each version of an illusion has its own name, uh, its own branding. Um, the word woman there, uh, it's not always been a woman. Um, sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's more than one people, sometimes it's not a, per a person. Um, and the other thing is that sawing a woman in half really isn't that hard. The hard thing is putting the two pieces back together again. 1921, P.T. Selbit introduces to the world the first version of the illusion, sawing a woman in half. And you may notice from this picture uh, two tiny aspects. One of them is that you don't, you don't get to see the hands and feet of the assistant inside the box. So clearly a different illusion from the one you may have seen on TV. Uh, the other interesting thing about this picture is that even though there's a murder going on, people are more interested in looking at the camera. It's like, you're murdering someone, but hold on, they're taking my picture. <laughs> um, the picture doesn't show what happened before and what happens later, so I have to tell you that the assistant has been tied up and placed into an empty box, and the box actually is being sawed. You can see on the, on the floor here. Um, if you look at this nowadays, you'd figure this, this is a puzzle. Um, how on earth does the person inside the box uh, get free of the, the ropes? Uh, manages to hide on one side of the box uh, and then back together to the original position. But back then, this was amazing because there, no one had ever seen nothing or anything like this. So this man, Horace Golden, saw this illusion. He recognized the potential in the illusion and he took it with him to the United States. Uh, but his first performance was billed as clumsy and hasty. So another magician, Howard Thurston, helped him create a new version that is more closely to, to what we've seen today. Uh, so here we, you see there's a, an empty box coming, coming on stage, there's only one assistant, you see that the person goes inside, inside the box, you always see the hands, the feet, the head of the assistant, a saw blade goes through the box and the two pieces are separated and you see the extremities 
moving and you know the person is still alive in two places at the same time, which is impossible. And that's what makes it a miracle. That's what ma makes it magical. So Horace decided to make a lot of money from this. At one point, Horace had as many as eight magicians touring the United States, all doing the same show. And they all were doing also the, the woman sought in health. This was franchising in magic. Uh, and Horace decided to protect this secret. So how did he, he do to, to protect it? He filed for a patent. He actually filed for patents of many different methods of this illusion. Uh, these are, are some of the actual drawings of the box. Um, there's also a detailed account on everything that happens, everything that takes place inside the box, how the box works, how the assistant moves, everything. Now, it's going to look like I'm sidetracking a bit. I'm really not. I'm coming back to this in a little bit. But a quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with the TV show Mad Men? OK, quite a few. Uh, if you've seen Mad Men, you may have seen this man, Don Draper, present a series of clever advertising campaigns. And one of them in this scene is a campaign for Lucky Strike with the slogan, It's Toasted. So Don explains that by being the first brand to claim that their tobacco was toasted, even though every single brand of tobacco was toasted. And that that was the reason that their tobacco tasted better. The audience, the public, would understand that as being the truth. They would believe them. Uh, what you may not know is that this was an actual campaign. Lucky Strike actually did this. Not in the 60s, as Mad Men portrays it, but rather in the 30s. They ran a series of posters explaining that the reason uh, that Lucky Strike tasted better was that their tobacco was toasted. So sales went up. Other brand sales went down, and the other brands had to do something about it. And R.J. Reynolds, the company behind Camel Tobacco, created a campaign aimed at debunking this campaign. And their goal was to tell the public that they were being fooled. So they ran a series of posters explaining how some classic illusions worked, how the audience was being fooled. In this one, for instance, uh, they explain how a magician is able to get on stage assemble a doghouse without a dog, and then the dog comes out of the doghouse. And at the end, down here, uh, two men uh, discuss uh, tobacco, and one of them finally says, oh my god, I have been fooled all along. Uh, these, these cigarettes really taste better. And at some point, they ran a poster explaining the inner workings of the illusion sawing a woman in half. They explained how the illusion worked, and then they made this parallel, this comparison to tricks in advertising, fooling people. Uh, so Horace had to do something about this. Horace had the patent, Horace could sue. Um, actually, the original creator of the, the illusion, Sawing a Woman in Half, when he went to the United States, he was, was actually prevented from performing his own illusion because Horace had the patent. And to the eyes of the court, he was the creator. So Horace sued R.J. Reynolds. He had the patent. He sued and he lost. He lost because, according to the judge, R.J. Reynolds weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't using the method themselves. Uh, they weren't making money out of it. They weren't performing the method. Uh, they weren't even creating the boxes and selling the boxes. All they were doing was publishing information that was readily available at the U.S. Patent Office. And that is the reason that Horace lost. And it's also the reason that Horace never filed for a patent again and the reason that there's no patent for his next version of the illusion where he manages to saw through a person without a box with a giant saw blade. Uh, if you find this version to be impressive, take a look at this one. So it was the fact that the secret came out that pushed Horace into new versions of the routine. And throughout the ages, um, throughout this past century, many different versions have arised. I am particularly fond of this one. Uh, this very same magician uh, was once performing this illusion on his wife on national TV in India, live. And the moment the buzzsaw touches his wife, they cut to the TV host, to the show host. He signs off, and the show ended. And all across India, they knew that something went wrong. And something did go wrong. What happened was that uh, they ran out of time, and they had to cut it short. That's it. Nowadays, if you go to websites like Wikipedia, you can find drawings of some of, the, of these classic illusions, explaining how they work. Um, and these drawings pose two questions. The first one is, who the hell is drawing these things? And the second is, is this really how it works? 
because I'm pretty sure when I saw this on stage live, the saw blade was going right halfway through the box and not two thirds down. Was the table really that thick? I'm pretty sure the table was really, really thin. There couldn't be a body in it. And the fact is that at some point, these illusions might have worked this way. But the fact that the secrets came out forced people to create new illusions, new versions uh, with transparent boxes, with boxes that open to show that the person is still inside. Um, pen and Teller, for instance, uh, that's Pen over there, Teller over here. We're coming back to Teller in a few slides. They have this very clever version in which they show you the inner workings of the illusion and they still manage to surprise you in the end. There's one particular version of the, the sawing illusion that I need to talk to you about, um, which wouldn't exist without this man, Johnny Heck. There's two secrets about Johnny that I'm going to tell you today. One of them is staring right at you. Because you see Johnny leaning on the table, and you may not realize that Johnny isn't leaning on the table. Johnny simply is on the table. This is Johnny. Johnny didn't have half of his body. But the second secret is that Johnny had something else. Johnny had a twin brother. So try to imagine the illusion that they came up with. Um, and this man, he was a, an accomplished man. Uh, he became a magician, a musician, he ran a small orchestra, he was a businessman, um, he, he was one of the actors in the cult movie Freaks. Um, and they had an illusion where his brother would be the one person from the, uh, the audience going on stage and being sawed in half. At one point they would make a switch. Uh, and they would make a switch for Johnny and um, a small man inside some pants. And the routine was hilarious because the goal was to make people laugh. So Johnny would chase his legs throughout the theater. And then they would, would assemble him again and do the switch again. And Robert, his brother, would leave the, the, uh, the theater uh, a bit confused. Um, fast forward a few decades, and there are beautiful routines right now. Um, Kevin James uh, has this wonderful routine which shares some of the principles but has some uh, newer things on it. Uh, this is a promotional shot, but this is what it really looks like. Uh, he accidentally um, cuts through his assistant with a chainsaw on stage and then they have to assemble him live. Let's go to a different illusion, shadows. Teller. So Teller has on stage a plant, a vase, and there's a beam of light projecting a shadow uh, on a canvas. And Teller walks on stage with a knife. And here's what's going to happen. Teller is going to use a knife on the shadow. And whatever he cuts on the shadow gets torn in real life. This is a beautiful piece of magic. Um, and Teller has been performing this for at least four decades. Uh, to the point that most magicians now recognize his routine as being Teller's. It belongs to him. No one else is going to perform it. Or so we thought, uh, until a few years ago, uh, when another magician uploaded a video on YouTube of himself performing the same routine, claiming to have come up with a different method, and offering to sell the, the trick, to sell the method and the presentation for about $3,000. Uh, magic is expensive, by the way. And Teller got in touch with him, because Teller didn't want other people to perform his illusion. Uh, so he got in touch with him, and he offered to pay him for the exclusivity for the routine. Uh, Garrett said no, uh, so Teller sued. Can you guess what happened? First of all, the method is different. But the thing is, Teller never filed for a patent. Instead, in, back in 1983, Teller filed this, this routine as a, a theater play with a US copyright office. He described everything that the actor, the performer does on, when go going on stage, every single move. So Teller sued, and Teller won. Uh, I should say, for the sake of clarity, that even though I'm telling this from the perspective of Teller, uh, Garrett has a website where he explains his side of the argument. So if you want to know the whole story, you should also check his website. So sawing a woman in half and shadows. Where am I getting with this? I'm getting it method and presentation. There's a lot more to a magic trick or a magic performance other than method and presentation. But if this were your first magic lesson, I would be telling you that there's two things that you need to concern yourselves about, and that's method and presentation. Without one of them, you have nothing. 
And I would argue that this is valid wherever your line of business is. You always have method and presentation. If you're a programmer, if you have a website, there's method and presentation. There's your data, there's your servers, there's your algorithms, your everything that, you, that you've created, and there's your presentation, what you show to your users. Um, if you have someone steal your method, then they can come up with a different presentation. If someone gets your presentation, then they can come up with a different method. That doesn't mean you have to stop there. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you have to give up. Um, if you're creating a car, there's method and presentation. You have, if you have a restaurant, there's method and presentation. Uh, if you're creating your own company, your startup, if you're an entrepreneur, there's method and presentation. Always. And there's also two schools of thought, uh, sharing secrets and keeping secrets a secret. And in both sides, uh, you have advantages and disadvantages. If you're sharing secrets, um, maybe you get more visibility. Uh, people will recognize you as the person who created them, uh, unless you're P.T. Salvat and the other person created a uh, file for the patent. Um, and you also might benefit from improvements because other people might help you. Uh, open source, for instance. If you're not sharing, maybe your work is more valuable. Uh, there's exclusivity that people have to go for you, to you for, the, for that. They have to pay you. Uh, and conversely, if you're sharing, maybe you have less value um, and maybe there's less work for you. But if you're not sharing, there's less visibility. And maybe whatever you created is a bit dependent on your team. Uh, there's no one else to help. So this brings me to a couple of questions that I want to leave you with. And those questions are, for every goal, for every venture, for every test that you have, for everything that you undertake. What is your method and what is, your, what is your presentation? What do you want to do with your secrets? And if someone happens to steal your idea, uh, if you happen to find out that somebody else already had uh, the same idea a few years before, what are you going to do? Are you just going to sit down with your arms crossed and complaining about it? Or are you going to stand up and create something 10 times better than whatever existed before? Thank you.